Hello, everyone. This is Professor Tom Curry. And someone pointed him out to me and said, hey, did you ever listen to Professor Tom Curry? Uh, he says a lot of the same things you do. So I have been watching them. And I have to say, uh, if Professor Curry tries to blame feminism on another group of men, it's over. He is actually not pro-male. He is actually anti-male. Now, this isn't a very good sign. Tough Talks, they mistook a backlash for a movement. He's talking about feminism. So the feminist movement is a real movement, very real. And he, I have a feeling he's going to blame it on someone else. But before I get into it, just realize here's all these black suffragettes. And here's a article talking about first came suffrage, then came the women of the Ku Klux Klan. So there were the everyone knows that these white suffragettes were absolutely just as racist as every other person, as any man of that era. And yet black women joined up. Why did they do that? Because these black women know that sex trumps race. I'm going to repeat that because it's important. Sex trumps race. They know that they're going to be seen as women first and as black people second. And that all the rights being stripped away are really going to be to be stripped away from black men or in, in the case of that era, uh, the black men weren't going to get those rights. Right. So the professor here better realize that. Now we'll start around here and we'll start as an introduction. Do, do, do. So what I'm going to do today is talk about feminism, not as a movement, but a backlash against black male emancipation. There you go. He's already failed. It's a backlash, according to him, against black male emancipation. So in other words, what he's trying to spin is that black men already had the vote or weren't slated for the vote. Feminism wouldn't exist. Now, he's just wrong about that. And there's a lot of things about feminism that we just don't know, that we don't study. Well, that's sad that you don't know because anyone can find out. I found out. So if you, for him to say that means is he hasn't even bothered to look or he's spinning some propaganda. Because we take a kind of pop culture orientation to it and we devoid it from his actual historical situation and context. So quite often, the more popular an idea becomes, the harder it is to question the rise of that idea. So introducing skepticism or questioning the propagandist aspects of what has become a cherished ideal, a belief or thought to be obvious or intuitively correct is often seen as heresy. Feminism has become such an idea. Over the last several decades, the history of white women's rights movement as its leaders have become increasingly described as not only influenced by racism, but intimately committed to the preservation and imperial projection of white supremacy. It is not influenced by racism. It is a mere coincidence if a white woman who is a feminist is also a racist. After all, Professor, the hashtag me too though it has gone after many high status white men so it's about sex period it's only coincidental if you are a black man who gets sapped all men are slated all of us are, are targeted for example the historian Louise Newman has argued that quote racism was not just an unfortunate sideshow in the performance of feminist theory Rather, it was center stage, an integral, constitutive element in feminism's overall understanding of citizenship, democracy, political self-possession, and equality. Rather than being... No, it was not center stage. Center stage is the demonization of men. That's what center stage is for feminism. Because you see, today, no matter... You, no point to arguing about the past when you can see it today. Because if, if Professor was right about what he's saying, you would still see it today. You don't. You see all races of men getting zapped. 
In a generative critique of the race's legacy, suffragists, segregationists, and the competing political ideologies of 20th century America, much of the interpretive fervor given to the racism of American feminism has focused on the historical failure of integrating black women into the feminist movement. And the <clears throat> failure? I see black feminists everywhere. I see feminism showing up in Korea and, and China and Japan. It comes from the desires of women, Professor the contemporary absence of intersectionality amongst white women. The explanation of feminism's failures have been articulated as failures of inclusion, the exclusion of black women. Little to no research has evaluated the cost of feminism's racist caricatures and political appeal to white supremacy to black men. The previous research by historian Michelle Mitchell, specifically her article entitled Lower Orders, Racial Hierarchies and Race Rhetoric, Evolutionary Echoes in Elizabeth Cady Stanton's Thought During the Late 1860s is exceptional in showing that the dangerous racialist thinking of white suffragists such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton redefined the movement. Mitchell is No, it didn't. The, the movement has always been man-hatred. I not see Stanton's ideas as blameworthy, however, right? Because Mitchell doesn't want to see Stanton as fundamentally connected to the kind of discrimination that happened in the late 19th and mid-20th century. The violence of feminism is pursuits of imperialism, is violence and criminalization of black men and other racialized males, its demand for segregationist logics to protect womanhood. By the way, thank you for saying imperialism, because I agree with that, Professor. Uh, feminist women LARP as Marxist and communist. Every one of them are full-blown capitalist. They, they, they draw resources from men. Trust me, they're 100% capitalist, every one of them. Have not been properly pursued by black theorists in such a way that has become part of the dominant historiography. Despite black males being the group specifically targeted by white suffragettes during the debates over the 15th Amendment and by women's rights groups who feared engaging in a public field of free black men who they thought were rapists. By the way, they didn't think they were rapists. That was their propaganda. They were smearing black men as rapists. And don't kid yourself. They do that to all men now. It's simply that women use that uh, propaganda against men that they feel they can discard. Back then, the, the women of the 1800s and early 1900s, they could discard black men. And as you can see, now in modern times, due to technology, they can discard white men too. And you'll notice that all races of men, that's Hispanic, Asian, white, are now all rapists. We are all rapists now, right? These ideas not only mirrored the ethnological thinking of the day, but sought to advance such racial theories as public opinion and social consciousness on the matters were not only tied to race, but racial manhood. If scholars accept, as they often do, that 19th century feminism was a transformative movement that changed the social consciousness of his day, then we must also accept that his racism was not solely isolated to the minds of his architects and leaders. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was a racist. She believed wholeheartedly that white women were more evolved than blacks and more developed and civilized than black men. Yeah, exactly. Black men, that's right, because you were a man. They feel they are more civilized and above men. Your race was coincidental. And this is fundamentally important because in 19th century ethnology, the way that we understand gender was not exactly the way we understand in the 21st century. In the 19th century, genders did not talk about bodies. They were characteristics of races. So when you talk about a patriarchal race or patriarchy, you're in fact actually talking about one race, whites. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton is advancing an argument that suggests that she is more civilized, more developed, hierarchically developed than black people. And that meant that she was in fact more patriarchal than black people. Okay, so now he's, he, the professor here is uh, upholding a feminist false framing of patriarchy. Professor, patriarchy doesn't exist, never did. We live in a matriarchy. And the proof is these suffragettes got what they wanted. 
and every wave of feminists you know, got the, what they wanted. You couldn't do that if it was a patriarchy. Even black men. As Corin T. Field writes in Struggles for Equal Adulthood, quote, Stan did all she could to convince Republican leaders that adulthood rather than manhood should determine political rights. To press her argument, she made a fateful choice. She decided to attack the political capacity of adult men by invoking scientific and popular theories of racial difference. The highlighting of Stan's beliefs should not distract the reader from the larger point concerning the specific ethnological theories, the racism, and the particularly misandric and dangerous views concerning the existence of racialized men as citizens with political rights. One must not be distracted by the historical context of this particular work. So this is not a conversation just about how they were racist. It's a question of how the movement itself utilized racism. What we would take today to be stereotypes about black men, scientific theories about the maturation of black men, such when they hit puberty, they don't become men, they become rapists. These were the popular ethnological theories of the mid 19th century. And these were utilized not just by Stan, but by other suffragettes in their propaganda to show that white women were in fact more superior safer and necessary to development of Western society. So what I will argue is that it's essential to understand the racialist discourse and political theories of 19th and 20th century feminism as a backlash against the enfranchisement of black men and the, the occupying of America with racialized male bodies. There you go. So he's just pushed up the idea that it was the idea of black men getting the vote that created feminism. That feminism was just a backlash to that, that it wouldn't exist without that case. So if black men weren't getting possibly got the vote, or if they already had the vote, then you wouldn't see feminism. He is completely wrong about this. He's trying to say that feminism, of course, uh, doesn't really have the power that it does. This is a coping mechanism. This man wants to make it about race, which means he will be against his fellow man. If you, professor, can't come to terms that feminism is what it is, a hate movement towards men and existed, it would have always existed, no matter what happened, then you were against your fellow man because you were not for the truth. Understanding feminism as a backlash is a necessary paradigmatic intervention into current historiographic accounts of women's rights. While there has been a swell of substantial work looking at the political ideology, imperial justifications, and racial reactions of white women to black enfranchisement, there's been no engagement with the positionality of black men, and both black and male, and their position is both black and male, in relation to the coalescence of white power and white imperial ventures on present interpretations of suffrage and feminism trajectory into the 20th century. Using the term racial backlash to describe feminism, I mean to convey a deliberate and dedicated program of action by a dominant group, in this case white women, who along with various white supremacist entities sought to eradicate the perceived gains of suffrage and citizenship for blacks through the criminalization of black men. Similar to well-established conceptualizations of racial backlash as, quote, a forceful swing against the perceived unwelcome change of the status quo, indicated by a strong adverse reaction against various racial remedies adopted by national governments for the effects of century-long discrimination, this has not been applied to feminism. While it's routinely acknowledged that racial or white backlashes accompany every racial advance from slavery to our post-Obama America, feminism's shift from universal suffrage to educated racialized suffrage rights remains unaccounted for by the literature. So what I want to do is why is it unaccountable? You, you don't believe that uh, suffragettes can also be racist? ...actually trace the construction of the black brute, the black male rapist, and his disposability within the discourse of American suffragism and Jim Crow. So, Professor, notice there are no name-calling of black women, are there? Are there? So that would explain perfectly why black suffragettes existed why they joined a bunch of racist white women. Because racism is a form of misandry. Do you understand that? Racism is a form of misandry. And these black women were not being targeted. They, everything you said was against black men, right? These white women were talking about you, not these black women. While it's often said that feminism is not anti-male, 
What I, in fact, aim to prove is that feminism was certainly and undoubtedly anti-black male. The 13th century, the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery in the United States, was ratified December 6th, 1865. By December 26th of that year, Elizabeth Cady Stanton had already sent a petition to the House of Representatives, Representatives and the Senate floor demanding the enfranchisement of all women in the United States as a class. Stanton was adamant. That there you go. They're talking about women as a class, not as a race. They didn't mention race at all. That white women were the rightful inheritors of the right to vote. She explicitly appealed to the nativist sentiment, sentiments of many 19th century statements when she called their attention to the fact that there were 15 million intelligent, virtuous, native-born American citizens who were now the only class who stand outside of the pale of political recognition. The appeal to the native-born and virtuous character of white Exactly. You black guys weren't involved, were you? They weren't including you. You are a patriarch from being a male. It just means if you're a man, you're a patriarch. Doesn't matter that you were a slave. Patriarch is just another N word, professor. Now, let me take a look at it. I time stamped again. Okay, 4925, he calls Trump a misogynist. I want to check this out. We'll go way back here. We'll go right up 40, right about here. The wombs and guardians of white civilization. The same way that they were worried about Jews at the turn of the century and the Irish coming into America and white women formed WKKK organizations is a similar faculty that's happening when Donald Trump is identifying Muslims not only, only as political threats, but cultural threats to America's Christian nation. That feminism, that historical conscience and positionality that white women have played within the building of empire is what allows that sensibility to constantly reemerge. So when you see white women supporting Trump, despite his actual misogyny, despite his actual incompetence. Okay. Once a man uses the term misogyny unironically, he is against his fellow man. Misogyny is practically non-existent. You would have to search the world over for a guy who really just hates women for being women. Whereas misandry is standard. So this guy, he's going to, if he's not an outright feminist, he'd join the ranks. He would join them and attack other men with it. He wants to get at the white man. He's angry at the white man. And that's why he's calling this hate movement a backlash, right? And trying to make it about race. He doesn't want to blame women for what's in their own hearts. In spite of the fact that there are women join these racist white women because these women don't like you guys any more than the white women like us white guys. It's appealing to something that's much richer, richer and historically situated in how white women have interacted with racial groups. We don't often think of white women as racist, right? We don't think of white women as rapists. We don't. Yeah, why don't we though? I mean, that is true. But everyone treats it, including you, treat women like they're just naturally good. What is that called? The halo effect? Every race of man wants, has, feels the same way about women, no matter what the race of woman is. Well, think of white women as colonizers. So when we see white women doing something, despite the fact that this is what they've done for most of the 20th century, somehow we're shocked. And that tells me that there's an epistemic problem. Yeah, like you right now, calling this terrible hate movement a backlash and blaming it on race. No, one last thing. 101, white patriarchy gave you feminism. Okay. Like I said, he's going to blame the patriarchy. You're going to blame feminism on the patriarchy. Let's see. Feminism. Now feminism's on the rise because it's counteracting the civil rights movement. White women want a piece of this pie. And somehow after 100 years of black men being effeminate, savage people that are like cherub white children or white girls, they automatically become patriarchs. And we don't know where this patriarchy comes from. 
If you look at Dorothy Heights report, report to the president in 1963, she said that one of the major agendas of black women politically was to affirm the manhood of black men and help them with their self-esteem because they felt like lesser men. That's 1963 in an actual report that was given to the president. If we take Michelle Wallace's book seriously, that means by 1979, black men were full on patriarchs. That has to be the quickest evolution of patriarchy in the history of America, in the world. White patriarchy took centuries to build. Black men must be savants. But at the same time, after the civil rights movement, black men lose all their jobs. They lose all their political voice. They lose all their organizing. So that's why I say that if black men are patriarchs, they have to be the dumbest patriarchs in the history of the world. Because when you look at the generative aspects of white patriarchy, it created systems like the military, economics, foreign trade, imperialism, colonization, apartheid. That's what white patriarchy did. Hell, it gave you feminism. But called it, called it. He's blaming feminism on another group of men. So everyone talking about who mentioned Tom Curry, he is going to be against his fellow man. He can't call a spade a spade. He wants to, if he's the type of guy, if a woman slapped him in the face, he'd go over and find a man to punch. That's what's going on here. So he's a dead end. And here again, professor, it doesn't matter that you lost everything, that you're powerless as a man. When they say patriarch, they mean you're a man. These feminist, feminists are women who hate men. And it, it, you don't have to be powerful. It's rhetoric when they say you're powerful, you're not. They, when they say someone who's down and out, a man who's down and out, has power because he's simply a man, that is calling, that's just using the N-word on him. I want you to understand that. Patriarch is the N-word. It's just one of the many that have sprung up. And saying, you don't know your place. We're going to demonize you. So you're surprised. I'm not surprised. You're acting surprised because you don't want to deal with the fact that women don't like men. And there's a lot of women who absolutely hate men just for being born men. And so, again, this is a failure. Everyone, whoever pointed Tom Curry out to me, I'm telling you now, I have looked at it, he's a failure. Any man who looks for other groups of men to blame for what women do is going to be anti-male, not pro-male. He's going to be anti-male. So that we're going to end it here.